Relationships are simultaneously the most beautiful and difficult parts of our lives. And when our relationships are under strain or distress, the pressure we feel as a result can be overwhelming. And what can make it worse is, is our natural tendency to shy away from situations that might cause pressure. And, and when, it's a, when it's a person we're shying away from, we can unintentionally deepen the hurt and widen the gap that already exists in between us. Today, we continue our series called Under Pressure, where we are asking how we can respond to the pressures of life in healthy, godly ways. And one of the pressures we can find ourselves under is conflict inside of relationships. And while we might have the desire for a certain relationship to grow healthy and to heal, the very process of healing might require us to get more uncomfortable and perhaps feel an increase in pressure before there's any sort of relief. Now, when, when we find ourselves in high pressure situations, a lot of our abilities become impaired like the ability to empathize with someone else's situation or perspective. When we find ourselves under pressure, when, when we feel overwhelmed or, or we feel trapped, it can be incredibly difficult to put any effort into understanding others and empathizing with them, especially if that person is the one causing us the turmoil. We might find ourselves actively holding back empathy to protect ourselves or to protect our viewpoint. Another capacity that is often diminished when we feel pressure is our ability to embrace complexity. Our ability to handle nuances and complexities goes down when we feel that we're attacked or that we're out of control. When our emotions are heightened, we have a, we have a harder time diving deep into the ways our relationships with others are uniquely crafted. And we have a hard time hearing others express the complexities of their perspectives. And yet... We're complex individuals with deep stories and failing to recognize that will inevitably result in more conflict. But we also need people in our lives. We're, we're built for relationships with other people, yet we will fail one another at some point. So if, if we're unable to figure out how to do life together, to, to embrace complexity and feel empathy, we will end up being disconnected from people. We may find ourselves riddled with bitterness and painful relationships all around us. So if relational conflict is inevitable, but our need for people is deep, how do we respond when we find ourselves in relational conflict? How do we respond in a healthy, godly way? Well, Jesus gives us some specific instructions about how to interact and engage with people in our lives. And, and one of the clearest moments he does this comes on the heels of a question that's asked of him. One of the religious leaders in Jesus' day comes to Jesus intending to get him to discredit himself. So the religious leader asks him this question. It's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 says this, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now, the law of Moses was the set of laws the Jews had lived by for centuries. There were over 600 different laws. And this religious leader is asking Jesus to pick one that is most important. And this question is meant to be a test that Jesus would fail. But Jesus' answer is so good. Look at what he says. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. He says, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Notice that Jesus doesn't just pick one. He actually summarizes the intentions that exist behind all of the laws, which is in essence to love God, and love others. The rules of the Old Testament had these two intentions as the driving force behind them all. And notice that these driving forces are both relational. And the first relates to our relationship with God, while the second refers to our relationship with each other. And Jesus reframes the priority of the law on protecting and prioritizing relationships. But Jesus doesn't just spend time summarizing the old law. 
he also gives a new commandment. And that new commandment is also relationally focused. Jesus announces this new commandment at the Last Supper in between identifying Judas as his betrayer and him washing the disciples' feet. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says this. He says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. This is new. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. This is not just any kind of love. It's the, it's the kind of love that Jesus displays through his entire life, through his death and through his resurrection. And the question we have to ask is, what does that kind of love require of us? This, this question of, of application is, is what we should be asking ourselves as we journey throughout the whole of Scripture. We should always be asking how we take what we now know and apply it to our current situation. And this series has really been an effort to do exactly that. How do we take the truths found in Scripture and apply them to how we respond to being under pressure? It's all about application. And some of the clearest application of Jesus' teachings is is found in the letters that are written by Jesus' disciples. These letters written by people like Peter, Paul, his brother James, John, are all written to churches in specific contexts. And the writers are reflecting on what Jesus had already said. And they're applying those teachings to the context of the church they're writing to. So we get to see the truths of Jesus applied every time we read New Testament letters. Now, it can be easy to to read the Bible and look for just a definition of a word that's used. And and definitions can certainly be helpful, but definitions only live in our heads. What we really need, if we're going to do more than just increase our knowledge, is a demonstration. As we ask the question, what does love require of me? How are we looking? We're looking for how we love and follow Jesus. And this is exactly what Paul sought to describe in his letter to the church in Rome. In chapter 12, we see Paul describing what is required to love as Christ loved us. He describes what it looks like to be in a relationship with other people. Look at Romans chapter 12. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Let that sink in. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. He says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And then he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on me, live at peace. Have healthy, healed relationships, not just with some people, but with everyone. Paul is speaking about our responsibility in relationships, our responsibility to be peacemakers. And that doesn't guarantee that peacemaking will be reciprocated, but we are called to make peace if we can. And this comes through loving God and loving others, through loving one another as Jesus loves us. And Jesus' life and and ministry shows us what that kind of love looks like. He showed us what love is when he touched the leper. He demonstrated what it looks like to love others when he went to the homes of tax collectors and religious leaders. He showed what love is like when, when he went to the cross in our place and prayed for the very people who put him on that cross. And conflict existed within every one of those relationships, but Jesus chose to live at peace with everyone as much as it depended on him. 
He chose to overcome evil with goodness, not with power and dominion. Even though he truly possesses complete power and dominion, he never hid his power. Instead, he leveraged it for people, not against people. And in his summary of the law and in his new commandment, he gave us, he, he calls us to love in, in that same way, but not out of begrudging submission. Look at what Paul writes to the church in the city of Colossae. In Colossians 3 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender hearted mercy, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. There's the description of what this kind of community and this kind of love looks like. But what kind of action does this description produce? Paul continues and says, make allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. <laughs> Guys, this is, this is a tall order. To make allowance sounds like it means to give permission. But Paul didn't say that. He said to make an allowance for it, to plan for the existence of faulty people. And the allowance he asks us to make is to forgive anyone who offends us. Forgiveness is the allowance required for living in relationship with broken people. And what I love about this is that God went first. Look what Paul says, finishing up this section in Colossians. He says, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Guys, the cross is, is the allowance that God made for your sin and for my sin. It's the allowance he made to preserve the opportunity for us to be made right before him to avoid complete and total separation from his creation. God's forgiveness preserves our opportunity to repent and our repentance completes the ministry of reconciliation. And if he has preserved that opportunity for us, we can extend forgiveness and repentance to others because it was first extended to us. We're forgiven because God forgave. We love because we were loved first. And we've been called to be one as the body of Christ. Verse 14 continues with this. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace, there's that word again, and always be thankful. We're called to, to live in peace and, and peace is the result of right standing. Peace is impossible without reconciliation. To live at peace is to count nothing against each other and have nothing counted against us. And while perfect peace only comes from God, we can experience some of that peace when we choose to forgive and to repent. So if we're, if we're to love as Christ loved us, we have got to ask this question. What does love require of us? When we experience conflict in relationships, what does love look like in that context? When we live next to someone who has no regard for us, what does love require of us? When our spouse's decisions cause us pain, what does love require of us in that situation? When our kids make decisions that hurt our reputation, what does love require of us? Ultimately, love requires us to repent, to turn away from our past actions that have hurt God and have hurt others. And love requires us to forgive, to, to cancel the debt we feel others owe us. While each next step will, will be unique to each of our specific circumstances, we should all be moving toward extending forgiveness and offering repentance. And if we feel the pressure to accomplish this kind of deep work by our own strength, may we be reminded that this kind of work gets done by the power of Jesus in our lives, not by our own strength. Now, if you're listening to this today and, and, and you don't know what your next step is and you feel like you need help to determine 
what that is, I want to encourage you to take advantage of some of the additional resources that we've made available for this series specifically, but also some that are available all the time throughout the year. The first one is our Under Pressure Lab that's been going on at each of our campuses. You can check out your local campus for times, for dates, and for the remaining topics that are available to learn more about what's coming up. I also want to invite you to take a look at our referral list for counselors in our area. Meeting with a counselor can be a very healing and helpful way to navigate some of the pressures that we find ourselves battling in our everyday life. And sometimes just knowing where to start looking can be all you need to get started. We've got local counselors on the list as well as counselors who do online sessions. And these counselors have been vetted by our church and other organizations that we trust. And you can find that link in the notes below. The last thing I wanna highlight today is prayer. Sometimes knowing others are alongside you in prayer is the very thing we need to feel hopeful. And we also believe that prayer is not only hopeful, but it's powerful. So don't hesitate to fill out a prayer request online or to visit one of our in-person services to receive prayer so that you can kind of have that opportunity to get that support from us in that way. Now, as we ask ourselves, what does love require of us in each of our circumstances that we have? May we seek to be peacemakers. May we live at peace with everyone as far as it depends on us. And may we do all of this in response to God's incredible love for each of us. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for going first, for pursuing us, for extending forgiveness and giving us the opportunity to offer repentance. God, thank you for covering each and every one of our circumstances with your presence and your love and with your blood. God, I pray that you would give us the courage and the boldness to take that next step towards forgiveness and repentance in those relationships that we have that are broken or that are hurting. And God, may we rely on you for the strength and that courage that it requires. God, we love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to uh, just continuing to answer this question. How do we respond in healthy, godly ways to the pressures of life? We hope that you'll join us for the next message in our series. And we really look forward to continuing to pursuing Jesus together. We love you guys. We'll see you soon.